Lord and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Pour out your spirit of wisdom and understanding that our hearts and minds may be opened today. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 to 24. Listen now for the word of the Lord. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the, dev- to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask, because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So here at Cherokee Presbyterian Church, over the last month or so, we have been doing a new sermon series on 1 John. So um, some of these words and these ideas shouldn't really be new to you because they're all very similar and go together in the whole book. So we've been exploring what sets us apart as heroes living in a world of which we are not. God indeed calls us to live in the world even though we are not of the world. And because of that, the Spirit gifts us with a special skill set that we can use while living in this world. Skills that help us to conquer evil and sin and to live in the light of the Lord. Now you would think that the early Christians of the time of 1 John, being so close to the life of Jesus, would be all on the same page. Having been, most of them taught by the disciples themselves. Right? You would think that they would have it easier. Things would be easier, but that's not the case. This book is believed to be a homily written or given to a group of early Christians near Ephesus who found themselves already in a theological crisis, dealing with fellow believers, likely friends, people who sat next to them in, I guess, house church, right? Friends who sat and worshipped and believed in Jesus with them. But these friends have left the church due to differences, theological differences, even though at that time they didn't know what theology was, right? But they knew who Jesus was, and they were experiencing differences of ideas. These people who have left the church, I've heard them called secessionist opponents, they have seceded from the church. They have left the church, and now they're living in opposition to their former believers, to their former brethren. They are creating outward hostility, and they are spreading false teachings about Jesus. And their teachings that they claim still come from the Holy Spirit. And mainly, they're teaching that Jesus did not have a real human body, that he was only here spiritually. He didn't have a real body. You're like, what? No body. But their teachers met Jesus, They saw him in a body, uh, but their teachings, these 
these secessionist opponents were teaching that Jesus' sufferings, because he didn't have a real body, were not actual physical sufferings and only apparent sufferings. You can see that that is just vastly different than what the early church was preaching already and what we believe today. You can imagine that this would be difficult because we see ourselves friends who have left churches and denominations over disagreements. You see denominations that even stray theologically. You can imagine when you have a difference in doctrinal beliefs, political beliefs. Sometimes people leave the church because of the songs we choose to sing in worship or the color of the carpet when it has to get changed in those old churches. People leave churches because of differences, and it creates conflict, right? If your friend who sits next to you in church suddenly leaves so angrily because of something that they believe that's different, it hurts your friendship. It hurts the body of believers. And this is what they're experiencing at that time. Though I will say that saying that Jesus' sufferings are only apparent is much different than disagreement on the color of carpet, right? So John now delivers a homily to them to encourage them and to plead with them to continue to be who they were called to be by God and not to be like those who left the church. The passage in chapter 3 begins by saying, for this is the message you heard from the beginning, from the beginning. So this is not a new idea John's presenting. It's a reminder in their context to do one thing that Jesus has commanded them to do that sets them apart as the children of God, to be people who love one another. And, you know, we just sang this song, Reckless Love, and while we were singing it, I was just thinking about, uh, sometimes we talk about the love of God, and we talk about loving each other, and you're like, oh, I love you, you know. But think about how God loves us so passionately, so much, that even when we don't deserve it, he gives himself to us. He brings us into his fold. He loves us recklessly, powerfully. And that, when I say that Jesus commanded us to love one another, is how we are commanded to love one another. Recklessly, passionately, because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. When trouble arises, when conflict arises, the best thing to do is to go back to the beginning as John is doing here. And he's going back to loving one another. When we go back to the beginning, we think about one of the infamous words in the Reformed tradition, reformed, right? In our denomination, we talk about Reformation being reformed and always reforming. But usually we get that phrase wrong, thinking that it simply means change. And then we get ourselves into a heap of trouble, or we could, because when you make changes, you run the risk of allowing culture to influence and inform our beliefs. Rather than the Bible and the Spirit informing how we believe and thus how we ought to live. And that's probably how these Ephesians who left the church got themselves in trouble, right? they probably came to believe what they did because they thought they were changing, moving with the times. Listen, you know, they don't realize it, but they're listening to those outside voices rather than listening to the foundation and growing from there. If we take apart the word reform, we have re-form. Anytime you have re and something else, it means you're doing it again. You return somewhere, you're going back. So you're going back to the beginning, and you're starting fresh. Think about uh, when you were a kid playing with Play-Doh, or maybe now in adulthood you're using clay to sculpt something. You know, you've got your clay, and you're sculpting it, and um, sometimes it's not quite right, and you make changes, right, the changes. But sometimes, eventually, if it's before it gets all right, we're still always working on our lives, right? When you're working on making it, sometimes the changes you make, it gets too far away from what you intended. And so what do you have to do? What do you do? 
you squish it down, and you start from scratch with your base. That is what it means to reform. You go back to the beginning. You go back to the foundation, and you rebuild from there. And here, the beginning that John wants us to go back to is Jesus' command, reiterated time and again, to love one another. In the book of John, chapter 13, in the book of John, chapter 15, just two chapters away, Jesus reiterates, love one another as I have loved you. Those are not the only places it appears in the Bible. But the importance of how often this is said lends itself to the importance of this command. Love one another as I have loved you. It's an old point. It is a foundational point. And so in 1 John, he has to take a new tactic, right? Have, if you've ever taught math or been in a math class, maybe you're not good at math, I don't know. When you're teaching math, so let's say you're in class and your teacher says, you know, this A plus no, I don't even know. Okay, let's say you're getting a math concept. I'm not going to try to make one up from up here. But you don't understand it, right? What does your teacher do? Your teacher says the same thing over again, and you're like, I still don't understand it. You're going to have to say it a different way. And a good teacher knows that. A good teacher has multiple ways to teach you the same math problem and how to do that. That is what John is doing here. He has to come up with a new way to say the same thing because these people are in a new context with new conflict. They need to be reminded, but sometimes we need to be told again differently. So what First John does, what John does in First John is he amplifies the lesson. He uses this new tactic of using examples, imagery, stark contrast, he uses hyperbole. He uses extreme examples to say, remember that Jesus said this? And just have it in their face. New ways. So he compares light and dark, love and hate, righteousness and sin, death and life. To drive the point home, he goes for the extreme example of Cain and Abel. And Cain has become a model for those who deliberately disbelieve. There's no middle ground is what John is saying here. If you don't love, you hate. There's no fence sitting being done here. You, they can't exist together. Even a little bit of light casts out darkness. So John wants you to embrace this command to love one another because when you love one another... You cast out the hatred that seeps in. This reminder is at the heart of all things as we see that all things converge in God's love for us, displayed in Christ's selfless sacrifice on the cross. And based on that, God's greatest expression of his love for us, we know that love to God is a verb. And I've probably said that up here before, but I truly believe it, and Scripture says it. It is not just a gushy feeling of affection, but it's an act to be done, performed, shown each and every day. We remember God loves us because he showed us he loves us. God knows we love him because we show God that we love him. And other people know that we love them because we show them we love them. We do things to show them we love them. John says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. These secessionist opponents are not loving with actions or in truth. From what John is saying, not only are they spreading false teachings, but they're not supporting their friends. They're not supporting their fellow believers anymore. They're not willing to lay down their lives for their brothers and sisters and not willing to share material possessions as Jesus had instructed them to do. There was never any question about what Jesus asked of them. And yet they weren't doing it anymore. We can assume based on this that all of the people of the early church were doing that previously. They were supporting each other. They were loving one another. But when these differences of beliefs 
crept up, people abandoned each other. And now there was an absence of love. They were creating conflict, right? Conflict doesn't create itself. People create conflict by how we choose to relate to one another. And if you're not relating in love, the other stuff creeps in. You can imagine then that these believers are thinking, well, our friends said they were believers too, and yet they strayed. Our friends said they were believers too, and yet they changed the way that they believed or what they believed. And so you can see that there may be some doubts are creeping into them as well. But John doesn't want them to be left doubtful of their own standing with God. He is reassuring them that their contact their conduct shows whose they are. And basically, he says, God knows your heart. Right? If your heart is good, if you are doing what you're commanded, if you are sharing your belief in Jesus Christ, if you are confessing to Jesus Christ that you believe he's Lord and Savior, God knows that. So if you doubt yourself, don't worry. God's bigger than that and bigger than you. If you find you're feeling pretty confident in your life, well, don't worry about that either because that's just your will aligning with God's will. He says, anyone that does not love remains in death. Remains. He's basically saying that those who left the church never really had life to begin with. You can't remain somewhere if you weren't already there. Where in contrast, he states that because we love each other, we can be assured that we have eternal life residing in us presently and forever. So don't worry about becoming like them. You won't because God chose you and you're one of his. Our conduct is a direct result of indeed being children of God, chosen to love and be loved. We respond by keeping his commandments, including to love one another. The connection between love and obedience is a recurring theme throughout all of John's teachings. Those that left the church, those secessionist opponents, are no longer concerned with God's commandments. Certainly not the command to love one another. Because when you love one another, you don't abandon each other. When we confess faith in Jesus Christ and obey his commands, we claim the victory of Christ as our victory. And we, too, overcome the world. It is a victory that has been won in love because love conquers. It doesn't take a genius to know that when we act in faith and in love, the world, our world, is just better. So what is it to love? To love is to believe. To love is to ex accept responsibilities that come with being a member of the family. To love is to obey God's commands, especially to love as he loves us. To love is to stand victorious over the world because love truly does conquer all. John says, don't be surprised if the world hates you. We're not of this world. So don't be surprised if the world does not exude the love of Christ as you do. Don't be surprised that there will be discomfort and conflict. Whether you're distraught over friends who have made themselves opponents, over a church family that is changing instead of actually reforming, over the hate that causes the wars that are taking place around the world as we are even here worshiping right now. We are not called to hate even in the midst of these things, but to avoid hate and to embrace love, to care about people. Anne Lamott, an author on life and faith, had this to say a couple years ago when our own country was going through some turmoil, uh, and I'm, I've probably shared this with y'all before, but I find it poignant today. People said to her, don't let them get you to hate them. Well, I did let them. Let them get me whipped up into a vicious kind of superiority, visions of revenge and perp walks, where I'm channeling Sissy Spacek at the end of Carrie. And it was good. There is beauty and meaning and resistance to evil. But for me, there's also plain old hate. 
Hate is on the one hand comforting and on the other malignant. And right here in church, I realized I didn't want it anymore. What I wanted was the love, the organized resistance, the guacamole shared with friends after church. I wanted to continue to help fund the resistance and to help people keep their spirits up, to serve the poor, pick up litter, listen to the very lonely, and I wanted to get over the hate, to get on the same old path of the Berrigans, of Gandhi and Dr. King and Molly Evans, peace and truth-telling and never giving up. This gave me hope then, and a few days later still gives me hope, in a slightly more deluded form than I felt in church. Okay, fine, it is a slightly victimized self-righteous hope, but I can feel it. I can feel sweet. I can switch channels and move from hate and judgment to the bigger picture, where if events seem to have a bad ending, maybe it's not the ending. I don't have a hope that this or that will happen, that insanity will change to wisdom and a focus on the common good. I don't have hope that the plates of the earth will shift politically next month, but I have hope in us. I really do. I have hope in goodness and goodwill, hope that I can be healed of my obsessions and fixations, I hope that just for today, I can stay sober and make a difference in the lives of the poor and keep my own side of the street clean. I have hope that swords do turn to plowed shares, just not maybe tomorrow afternoon right after lunch. I have hope because, as the prophet Joel said, our old will have dreams and our young will have visions. Dreams and visions. We don't have to be on the same political side as Anne Lamott to agree with her realization that we must focus on the common good. We don't have to be on the same political side or ideological side culturally as the person sitting next to us here today to focus on the common good. That is the common good for the church in the world, to remain in him, to love one another in action and in truth, to love people. Christian love implies Christian faith because God is love. Now, my movie sermon title this week is made up, I don't know if y'all noticed, Rob talked about it a little bit last week, but his sermon titles over the last month were about monsters, right? He was slaying vampires and killing dragons and all kinds of stuff, reminding us that we are meant to conquer evil, to be the heroes that conquer evil in the world so we've made a little bit of a shift, and my sermon title is not an actual movie title, but a made-up one meant to replicate a Hallmark movie. I think I'm starting to grab, get a persona up here, but that's okay. <laughs> so my sermon title is A Forever Kind of Love, and it is a love that we can trust. We know that when we watch a Hallmark movie, the main characters will work it out and love one another happily ever after. For us, a forever kind of love is a love that assures us that God lives in us and we in him. A love that took us from death to life, eternal life. That is our happily ever after. And we are assured of that as children of God. When we love one another, we are heroes in this world, armed with the spirit, bringing light in the darkness, Hope where there is despair, righteousness where there is evil, and love where there is hate. Go, do, love. Lives depend on it. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.